Okay. We are recording. So y'all are officially being documented now. So um, I guess for our roll call, we probably have to start out with that. Uh, I am Bruce Hartley. I'm assistant professor of communications and communications part, uh, assistant professor of communications, duh, communications department. Uh, I am, have been the chair of this committee for going on two years. Uh, that's why I kind of helped lead this first meeting. Um, I've been with Roger State for four years. Uh, my previous university was East Central University down in Ada, Oklahoma. And before that, I taught in Memphis. Uh, my specialty is public relations. Uh, I have a 30 plus year um, professional experience in the field of public relations and marketing in the business world. And I'm kind of a new teacher. I've only been teaching uh, at the university level now going on for eight, nine years. So I, I'm relatively new. So if everybody would go around, oh, Heidi is here. Hey, Heidi. I mean, I mute myself. Hi, just my other meeting got out early, so I thought I'd jump on. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Thank um, you. We have just been kind of, I've, we've been talking with um, Catherine and Tom, who are new community, uh, committee members talking about kind of what we've been doing over the past couple of years and what kind of this committee does. Uh, Chris and I gave them a little bit of information on that. And we were actually just started recording a few minutes ago. So, and I said, I'm going to record this and send it to Heidi and see if she'll do notes. <laughs> well, I'll definitely do notes for you. Sure. No problem. So, I was just introducing myself and I thought we'd go around the room and everybody can introduce themselves. You know all about me. Um, Heidi, Everybody, Heidi is a superstar, and oh, thank you. And we work together on a lot of projects. Um, she, she is. All I can say is we're we're blessed to have Heidi, and she needs to hear that more from faculty. Is what I think. So, so Hi, suck up. <laughs> hey, you don't need to suck up. I totally appreciate every good kind word, and also. Constructive feedback is good too, so I don't mind that a bit. I uh, check my ego at the door every day and just come to do good work for students. So um, that's the most important thing to me is that we uh, help students have transformational experiences, which mean that they earn college degrees and change the trajectory of their life. So yes, yes. that's important to me. Well, um, Heidi, do you want to introduce yourself uh, kind of a little bit about uh, what you do, where you come from, and that type of thing. That's what I did, and then we'll go around and we'll let everybody else do the same thing. Cool, sure. Well, in a nutshell, um, I have been here at RSU for five years as the VP and registrar. Um, I came from Kansas, a uh, small school called Friends University in Wichita, where I was 10 years. Uh, left there as interim vice president of academic affairs. Um, and uh, before that was at a proprietary or not-for-profit graduate program, uh, training clinical psychologists and uh, marriage and family counselors. Um, and uh, so that was a lot of fun, was vice president of administration there. Um, and before that, just uh, had a laundry list of other great uh, student affairs, student support service roles. Um, and really uh, knew that was my passion when I was an undergrad in college. I took a left turn in the student activities office, became a resident assistant in my uh, residential life uh, area and just knew that I wanted to be in college forever. So my parents were like, what? You can do that for a job? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I said, oh, sure you can, let's do it. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit of about me. I finished my doctorate from the University of Oklahoma two years ago now. In adult, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, higher ed administration, adult and uh, education, and uh, definitely uh, know that this this is the kind of work I want to be doing every day uh, and all day long. Uh, so my role here, I supervise admissions, financial aid, registrar, the testing center, uh, do some work in student recruit uh, retention. Um, kind of, kind of find whatever uh, role fits in terms of uh, figuring out how to in, 
invite students to come to RSU, how to make sure that they get here and onboarded really well into the campus community and how they stick here so that we uh, can manage enrollment and meet our institutional needs in terms of net tuition revenue um, and keep the doors open and all of you working. So that's what I do every day and, and love doing it and really see this committee as a vehicle to help us do better what we do every day. So thanks for letting me be a part of it. Heidi, um, I was just, for those of you go, we had a vacancy of our director of admissions and Heidi and I, I was on the search committee for that. Mm -hmm. Have you guys made any decisions on that yet that this committee could hear about or is it premature? Oh no, sure. We've actually made an offer and it's been accepted. So uh, a okay. young man by the name of Lee Johnson will be joining our team in uh, actually next week, Monday. Okay, so, okay. Yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll actually... And we will, we will want to invite him as an ex officio member of this committee. Will you? I don't know yes. if you've already mentioned that, but we will definitely get him on our future meeting invites. I will be mentioning that on Monday, okay. <laughs> uh, along with other fire hose drinking that he'll be doing. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about his background, maybe? Sure. He, uh, he started his uh, student uh, service or uh, admission sort of slash higher education career at NEO. Um, he was a coach and a residence life person there and then moved on to be director of an uh, assistant director of admissions and director of admissions at several other institutions, including Southern Nazarene, uh, Grand Canyon University, um, and also did a stint with a educational uh, corporate entity uh, doing some work in uh, pipeline development and uh, educational coaching. So um, what I really like about his background is he will allow us to build some infrastructure in an area that we uh, haven't really been able to focus on, but really see a need to focus on. And that is uh, two things, sort of the adult market returners to learning, um, and also those stu uh, potential students who are employees and have employer reimbursement programs um, to solidify those pipelines and, and invite those students or potential students to get their degrees at Rogers State. So um, I'm super excited about our ability to open up those uh, recruitment avenues for our team in addition to our, our strong focus on high school students. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, while we're in the in your area, uh, Catherine, do you go by Catherine or Kathy? Kathy. Okay, Kathy, you want to introduce yourself and then we'll, since you are new and I, I thought you were the same person who was coming last spring and I feel like a total idiot, but you know. <laughs> Perfectly fine. If uh, Heidi would have been Kathy here, Stockton. she would have saved me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm Kathy Stockton. I'm the Assistant Director of Financial Aid. Um, I've been at RSU for a little over two years now. And before that, I was at St. Gregory's University, which is a small, what is a small private um, Catholic school. It is no longer in existence. And um, so I'm relatively new to the financial aid world. I spent about 20 years with a regional hotel chain in the Southeast, working out of Atlanta, and came back home to Tulsa um about five years ago where i got into financial aid hey kathy and, did, uh, did you, kathy did you know josh young in the communications department at st gregory's mm, no i was on their tulsa campus oh okay so i didn't get to shawnee very often okay he's one of my colleagues on my state organization that's why i was asking okay yeah um yeah i, I worked at the, the tulsa campus which was mostly um, adult education Gotcha. They were all pretty much evening classes there at the Tulsa campus. Gotcha. Well, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Chris, do you want to uh, share a little bit about your background now? Yeah, a little bit. I'm a professor in the technology department. I teach computer science. And uh, I spent about 17, 18 years in industry writing software code being a software QA manager, places like 
into it and lesser known companies. Uh, Chris, that's why this you, is my I, sixth year at Rogers. Chris, uh, I didn't know you had that background, but now I know why I like you. We have we both have business background. Yes. <laughs> Go on. Sorry. Well, I also taught in public education for about 14 years, uh, mainly at the high school level, teaching uh, chemistry and AP chemistry. Uh, uh, and I also have an accounting degree and a uh, higher ed degree as well. So maybe I'll find out what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I, think, I think you're on Heidi's journey. You want to always be in college. <laughs> I love being in college. That's me, awesome. too. Uh, me too. I agree. What a great background though, Chris. I didn't know that. That's really cool. No, I'm, I'm really, it's really intriguing to hear. So is there anything else you want to share, Chris? I'm glad to be on the committee and I hope we can figure out ways to increase retention and increase uh, promote enrollment as well. Great. Okay, Tom, you're you're the other new kid on the block, so okay. it's your turn. Well, I'm I'm kind of like Chris. I've got a. I think I'm on my fourth life here. You know, I um I actually started as a research psychology major back many many decades ago. I tell my students I went to school with Fred Flintstone. You know, uh, but anyway, uh, I. Uh, I'm, I was born and raised in Southern California. My ancestors, I guess I would call them, I would always say my family, but really my ancestors are from Oklahoma and actually from Claremore. And so I call myself a reverse Oki, you know, we, the, the family all went out in the depression and my wife and I were both the first generation born in California. And now we've come back about 15 years ago. Um, I owned and operated three different businesses throughout uh, my lifetime in California. And uh, after 9-11, the uh, whole economy crashed and I closed one business and filed bankruptcy on another one. And uh, then uh, I went to work for the government uh, in the county government. And um, I never had a business class, never had an accounting class. Of course, I ran businesses, you know, for probably, uh, it was about 12 years. And, um, and I got into governmental accounting. And, uh, and so, you know, when we moved to Oklahoma, uh, I came at a time when they were doing the Vision 2025 in Tulsa, which was a great big, you know, capital improvements program and uh, built the BOK Center, that kind of stuff. So I always have to tell people that's what they built, you know, that everybody knows, but there was many things. So I got on with a company that was um, the project manager for the Vision 2025. And I was their auditor because I'd been trained in, you know, governmental auditing. And I, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. You know, that was really my passion, even though I'm trying to make a living, you know, like everybody else. Uh, that's why I had, had majored in research at my undergraduate, because I really wanted to go straight to PhD back then, you know, but it never happened. And so when I came to Oklahoma, I actually found Southern Nazarene University that you mentioned this uh, person was for, uh, you know was working at and um, that as like you said with St. Gregory and Southern Nazarene was you know adults were able to go back and I went th back and got my master's there and as soon as I graduated you know with my master's this is well we need somebody to teach statist statistics so I've been teaching at Southern Nazarene as an adjunct for oh, probably almost 12 years now and we did get a lot of students from St. Gregory, you know, that came over when they went under. And I, it was sad, I think, because St. Gregory was sure. really a good school. Um, then, uh, so I've taught there. I went back and got my doctorate in business and because I really always wanted to teach. So my, my last job before coming to RSU, which I just started last year, 2019, this is my second year. Um, and I was a chief financial officer for Tulsa County government. So through the vision 2025, that was a county thing. Uh, I worked for the subcontractor and then went to work for the county because, uh, and, and my background in computers was that they were doing a software implementation. And so they needed people that understood that. And, um, I went to work in the finance office at Tulsa County 
And when the CFO at that time had left, then I was able to promote into that position. So, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of experience, but uh, not all good. <laughs> Working with the government and seeing how they spend our tax dollars is not, uh, is quite stressful, let's put it that way. And I worked for eight elected officials uh, that uh, all had equal power. There was no balance, there's no balance of power in the county government in Oklahoma. Uh, unlike, you know, where you have a governor and you have a Congress or you have a mayor and a council, the county government has eight elected officials and they're all equal. And I work for all eight of them. And so, you know, they all thought that they were right and the other seven were wrong. <laughs> but anyway, I'm very happy to be at RSU. I love it. Um, it worked out really well for me because now I'm getting to do what I want to do. I love the small classes. I love having the like you were talking about, the connection with the students is, is great. Um, and even just being on my second year, you know, I know the kids in the hall and I can, you know, call them by name. And mm -hmm. it just is really a good feeling. I really love it. So, and I'm happy to be here on this committee too. So I'm looking forward to it. Well, welcome, Tom. It's, it, I'm starting to see a theme here between you and Chris and Kathy and also the direction Heidi is going with enrollment and really using data and research to guide us, uh, which is, as you know, academians, that's paramount for many of us in our work we do, but to see it weave into areas like admissions and retention and adult education and programming, I think it's very exciting. And that makes, and I will tell you all, my extent of computer work is I did own a social networking company for two years before I moved here as well. I forgot to say that. It was called Cloudmaker Media. I ran it for two years and I did all the social and I did all the branding and PR online through social media for about 10 companies. And uh, that's my extent <laughs> of the computer stuff. You all do a lot more computer stuff than me. I do the fluffy stuff. Um, but that's what I, that's, you know, that's what us calm people do. We do the fluff. So um, I think it's real interesting, Heidi. And I, I, I saw you nodding a lot. I, it makes me wonder if we might want to go uh, a little bit of a different direction with our our tactics and our strategies of this committee this year with the talent we have. What are your thoughts? I think that makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> you know, we've we've talked a lot in the faculty senate about how departments on campus need to tap into the expertise of faculty and staff. Uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy, you have expertise, obviously, in this area as well. And, um, you know, people that aren't here today, uh, Brandon, uh, I know would, would appreciate it from the marketing side. Um, Blake is from the art department. She's a little bit like me. We're, we're, the, we're the fluffy creative people. Um, and then uh, Kevin Waller, who is not here today, uh, of course, is um, a psychologist, academician, um, and he has a lot of published research with primary research, uh, so he really understands that importance of um, using data. So um, I'm, you know, I think we need to do some brainstorming between now and the next meeting, maybe as some goals. Um, that we can put into place for this year for this committee. And maybe we could come up with three or four. Um, and it, I don't know, maybe a couple for the fall and a couple for the spring that would take the expertise of the members of this committee and assist uh, Heidi and all the areas that she is over and Brandon in any fashion. Um, and maybe they can even give us, and we can ask Brandon to give it to us, but Heidi can give us some some prompts that might help us in that direction. I like that idea. I think 
I think to Chris's point earlier, one of the things that we probably haven't done really well, but we really need to to take a more intentional look at is, is who's retained and how, um, and then how we support, you know, I think we tend to get bogged down in supporting the 20, <laughs> the 20, and then 80, 20 rule, we support the 20 that really need our help, but the 80 are just left out there. And so, you know, if we do a better job, maybe reaching out to those 80 and what do they look like and who are they, um, we might spend a little bit um, more resources for a bigger bang for a buck. So I think that that would be something that I would be interested in thinking about how to to retool this committee or refocus this committee on that in that vein. That's a really interesting idea to me. You know, I don't think we have to do the committee just like we did the last couple of years. I think we need to use our strengths and, I, and I'm seeing strengths emerge as we're, you know, as you all shared your backgrounds, the three uh, members. From my from my perspective, um, what I what I would probably focus on that I could contribute is the importance of figuring out the proper channels to communicate with people, figure out when they want to be communicated and how they want to be communicated with, and maybe some of that is something you all can help with through some surveying or some some sort of computer um, research statistic type of information, because. I teach that every day to my students, that if they're going to go into the field of strategic communication, they can create all the pretty things and all the fun ads and all the fun videos that they want. They can do it till the cows come home. But if it's not going to create a return on investment, they are not going to, you know, it's just, it's, it's art. It's not strategic communication. And I am constantly battling with students to help them understand we have to strategically know how, when, and where to communicate. And so for me, it's that whole communication process that I, I would probably bring to this table um, that I think we are all looking at. I know, uh, I know that Heidi has mentioned they are looking at that. I know Brandon is looking at it as well. So if I can comment on, on your point and what Heidi mentioned as well, I know that last spring and this summer, there was a continuous flow of emails from Heidi, keeping us aware of enrollment status, but also giving us a list of things that we could do to contact our students and send out notices and try to encourage them to re-enroll and to enroll and to be more proactive than just reactionary when a student contacts us and said, I need to enroll. Great. Okay, I'll help you out. Uh, maybe those things that she listed would be the bones, the basic structure, and then what you're talking about with the types of communication would flesh out these things a little bit better. Although I think they work pretty well, Heidi, our enrollment looked pretty good considering we're in a pandemic. So thank yeah. you so much. You're I, welcome. That's so much better than we thought. So we we're thrilled right. that, and it, I mean, it was a team effort to your point, you know, we couldn't, I only have a finite number of people in my unit, and we could never have accomplished that without everyone's help. Now, but Heidi, I think that would be exactly right: is to figure out how to build a scaffolding and then detail it out so that people have actual, you know, ways of they have ideas of what to do, but then they also have pragmatic steps of how to do it. I think that your emails were very good. Um, I I know I. You heard back from me quite a bit on those. Uh, they inspired us and they helped us. And I think that that was the emails to faculty, I think was effective. So, and so when I, I so I, I, I wanna say that, but emails to students are not effective. Students do not read emails. We can tell them on our syllabus that they have to check their emails. They have to use their emails. I still get emails from Gmails and from non-email. Um, and I, when I get that, I remind them, please send it to me through your RSU email. But our students are evolving. And, you know, I have, this is my ninth year or ninth or 10th year teaching. I can see a big change in 10 years. And they, 
I use my RSU religiously. I use it for grade book. I use it for course assignments. I use it for all of my communication and I'm doing my best to get my students into that. But if I rely on emails, they, they, they won't. And, you know, we've got to look at the channel we're connecting with them. And it is not, it's, it wouldn't be unusual if we've got to start looking in DMs through social, net, social networks like instant uh, Instagram DMs, Twitter DMs, but we have to let the students tell us, how do you want to commu be communicated with? And we almost have to have a database for each one of those types of communication systems. And you maybe create your communication with, if it's a Twitter DM, of course, you're limited to 140 characters. So that creates another challenge. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I think the, the hardest part in our world today is there's so much clutter in all the different communication channels, but we have to know how our target wants to be communicated with. And if we don't know how, then we're, we're, we're missing the boat. And we also need to know how they want it and when they want it. Like what is the time of day they're more apt to look at something. And I think, all those have to play a role. To your point, what's been really interesting is we've, uh, over the summer, or I think probably towards the last spring, obviously we've learned a lot about <laughs> where our gaps are in terms of uh, good communication strategies when everyone was not here. You know, the curse of a small school is often that you rely on person-to-person -person conversation and you're gonna see the person in the hallway, it's Dr. Gerard's point, you know, you know the person in the hallway, you can see him, you can stop him, you can say, hey, I missed you in class or whatever. You know, when everyone was gone and we were all out, we really learned a lot about how we need to communicate better and where the holes are in our processes about around that. So, you know, one of the things that just anecdotally kind of bubbled up was was the concern of students that they're following 14 different feeds on a variety of different platforms just to get information about RSU. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you know would be really great and Brandon can help us think about this is how do we get to one source of the truth or one source of something or somehow get to one place where you know you can get the information you need when you need it and it's accurate and it's complete and it tells you exactly what you need to do. Um, the thing that we're seeing, I think in admissions is we're seeing students requesting a lot of information and then they're processing it when they want to. They're not necessarily processing it in the minute that they get it, but they want it all because they're gonna go back and digest it on their own time. Um, so that's kind of where I think we need to start thinking about how do we use our technology resources, my RSU as a good example, uh, and how do we start leveraging those to be better communication tools or to be, you know, or to shift our culture so that we're telling everybody that you need to go here. You know, this is the place where you need to be interacting with the university and sort of change their behavior in a way that makes sense and, and, and supports those kinds of things. That's all very tricky. <laughs> and the side of, if we want to change a culture of communication with digital natives that are coming to us after growing up with technology and we are the, I for instance, didn't grow up with technology it's tricky to say to us for us to decide how they need to do it. We've got to let them help us decide. Again, just like you've got to, if you're advertising anything, you're, you've got to know your demographic inside out. And you also have to know how they want to be communicated with. And I don't think, I don't think we're going to find a one size fit all. Uh, I think we might have a consistent message that is, that, that is a consistent strategic message. And that 
can be monitored and created and distributed somehow. But then there may be a variety of channels that distri distribution's done through based on the receiver on when and what channel they'll receive it on. And when I say channel, I'm, oh yeah, I think that, that's up, yeah. I mean the channel could be right. all the different options. Uh, you know, is it a phone call? Is it a face to face? Is it a direct message off a of social feed? Is it an email? Is it my RSU announcement? Uh, I will also say. We as, and I'm, I'm, a old, I'm a young baby boomer. Uh, I'm 57 years old. I was born in 63. And by demographics, I'm kind of one of the younger baby boomers. I'm looking at 10 years from now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire. My goal is to retire at 67, 68. But being a baby boomer, as we have been baby, baby boomers have run the country for many, many, many years, uh, that's that that guard's about to change and it is changing and even with how we communicate and when and where we've we've got to we've got to hear them but then the other part of it is how we how we give our classes i, I present our classes i love what you said about the 80 20 rule i think we have focused so much on the 20 percent that need on ground face to face that we have forgotten about that 80% pond out there that we can fish in, that we can pull people and do remote learning through Zoom, online, through blended, through all the different ways. Uh, and you can do them at night and you can do them on weekends. Um, and you can pull in a whole population that's all out there in that 80% is what I think. But I've I may be crazy about it, but I've been preaching this a lot. Um, and, you know, I think that could be a silver lining from the pandemic. Yeah, don't let a good crisis go to waste is what I say. I heard that, I heard, who said that quote? I heard that quote recently. Did you hear that from somebody? Don't let a good crisis go to waste. I think it's phenomenal, I love it. And I, I've heard that said, maybe I saw it on social media, but um, I love that quote. Um, we have, and Heidi, we need you to be our voice to administration so that they hear that from our committee, because I think, you know, I, I think that is very true. I think synergy is also working in our favor. There are several groups that are talking about these same things. You know, this newly constituted sort of strategic marketing committee, yep. the enrollment management committee, I know the faculty senate leadership team, and they're just some, you know, variety academic computing or academic technology committee. There are a variety of different committees that are kind of all working in synergy talking about this very topic. So I think that that's going to be to our advantage as well. But yeah, no, I have no problem being the voice and taking these things forward. We're often talking about, you know, we need to be paying attention to the shifting demographics and the shifting um, consumer preferences, even though they're not customers, but they are consuming a, our product, which is education. Their right. preferences are changing. Um, and we need to be nimble enough to realize that and act upon it, so. And to understand that it changes, uh, one of the things that, you know, the, the, when we're talking about us baby boomers and it's moving to millennials, millennials are all old now, you know, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, and the communication, you're talking about the mediums of communication, they change because what was good for the baby boomer, our email, and then it become Facebook. And now we've got a young group of people that, you know, Facebook is old fashioned and it's something new and it's always going to be changing very rapidly uh, with the technologies changing so rapidly that, uh, you know, look at how we all adapted to this Zoom in the last, you know, not even a year. Uh, and that shows you how quickly things are moving and the young people that we have are, you know, they're, they're just living in this environment to where that's the normal part of their life. So um, very, uh, Gary Vanderchuk, which was a, a big guy in marketing, he says, if your demographic is like ours, you know, somebody that's uh, 17, 18, getting out of high school, 
you need to start targeting them when they're junior high because five years goes like that. And then they're, they're the ones that, you know, are our customers. So good, <laughs> good point. Uh, you're, you know, I, I think this is not, we can't be static. It's got, we've got to see us as a dynamic situation that is constantly changing and I agree what was what was new four years ago is not new anymore um, you know when we talk about Facebook Facebook's something that grandmas and grandpas and moms and dads are on now to share pictures of their grandkids um, of course we're seeing it heavily used for political reasons as well but um, you know, a lot of my students say, ah, I have a Facebook, but I never check it now. My mom and dad are on it all the time. I don't want to be on it with them. And, you know, that's been the case since the 50s, when you think about it, when rock and roll came out. I have a quote from um, a, one of my, it's my professional organization I'm a member of, it's Public Relations Society of America, a quote that I found very interesting that can contribute to kind of some of this discussion. And it is a Garner survey of corporate leaders found that 82% plan to approve offsite working at least some time, some of the time. And 47% saying they intend to allow it to happen full time going forward. When you think of that quote, if that's what the business world's doing, we need to think about that in the academia world. And yes, our students are natives of digital and they, I think they embrace all the different options probably quicker than I know I do as, as an old baby, a young baby boomer. Um, but I will also say in talking to other colleagues of, about Zoom and about that, um, how we present our product, you know, teaching through Zoom that I've heard mixed feelings from faculty on staff on, on campus. I will tell you, for me, I have, near, have had nearly perfect attendance in my Zoom classes by my students, but I also require that I take attendance and they get attendance points for coming. So they have to be there, they have to check in, they have to stay engaged, they have to be able to turn their camera on anytime I ask them during the class to, to confirm they're still there if their camera's not on. And those are things that some people that do Zoom classes don't think about doing. And my students, I, I must have the bluff on them or something, but um, my, my students in my Zoom classes, I've got, I mean, I rarely have one missing, but that might be the most. And that's because they have an appointment or something and I will approve it as an excused absence if they can verify it, so. Um, I think we've got to look at this. I mean, I know we just recently turned in our teaching accommodations for the spring. Um, anyone that wanted to have teaching accommodations for the spring. And I found that very interesting that we turned them in for the fall, but we had to turn them again in again for the spring. I don't know why we, they didn't just repeat them for the spring in the situation we're in. And they could even be what's repeated for the future for many people. So. So at this point, at, we've been kind of zooming for a little over an hour. I, I really, this, you know, this kind of basic discussion about where we've been and where we might go with this committee was kind of what I hoped we would do today. And I think we've got a lot of good ideas. Um, if I think we need to decide a couple of actions. And the first one is who will be the chair for this new year? and who will be the secretary for the new year. And as I'll tell you what is what the chair does, the chair helps set the agenda, working with the secretary for the meetings, sends the agenda out, gathers everybody together on a good meeting time um, and helps lead the meeting. Um, the secretary keeps minutes and then supplies them to um, uh, the faculty senate where they keep copies of all the minutes from all of our committee meetings um, on a timely manner. And that's that's what we do. And last year, um, Heidi helped 
helped me with scheduling the Zoom meetings as well. And that was, that was really helpful as well. So that's kind of what we do. We try to meet once a month in the fall and once a month in the spring. So this is September. So I would say we would just do an October and a November meeting um, for what's left. So two more meetings this fall, and then we would come back together and do a, a February, March, and April in spring. Um, and that would get us, we don't have to meet that often, but I think we have enough to do that we can. Uh, I do like to limit, I'd like to limit, limit the meetings to no more than an hour to an hour and a half because I know we're all swamped. Um, how does all that sound, everybody? Sounds good. So, um, I would like to step down from being chair. Uh, I've done it for two years. Uh, and like I said, I, I'm on the strategic marketing committee and I'm also on the diversity committee. So I've got three committees this year and I've stretched myself out a little, little far on faculty Senate committees. And um, I will still of course be active on the committee and do whatever I can do to assist. But I, I would like to see if um, someone else would like to step up as the chair for this committee. Um, anybody? I nominate Waller since he's not here. <laughs> I, I love that because you know I I think I think Kevin said he would do it last year, but he w didn't want to his first year. Is that what he said, Heidi? Do you remember? Sort of. I think he said he might be interested, but only if you made him. I think yeah. was what I think I said. <laughs> you know, he is the vice president of our faculty yeah. senate, so he and I know he is on serving on numerous committees, kind of like myself. So. Um, I don't, he probably has more committees than I have. Um, but um, I think that's, I think that's an idea. <laughs> well, if I stayed as your secretary, right hand person, would you consider remaining the chair just to give a little bit of continuity <laughs> to some of the initiatives we might bring from where we left off and then morph into new initiatives this year? I would, but I don't want to hog the position. If if Chris or Tom would like to, to step into it, you definitely have my support. Um, I'm, I'm, that's very nice, Heidi, and I would consider that, but I definitely want to, I, you know, I, I'm looking at Chris right now. Uh, this is your, <laughs> too, but he's not is, looking at us. I know he's looking the other way. It's like in <laughs> class like, with, what the, else with can I do? What when, else? don't have eye contact with the professor. <laughs> Is that better? Chris, would I you have an, would you have an interest in being the chair? Uh, we could talk about it. <laughs> Why don't you and I get together and talk about it since you've done it for two years? Okay. We can do that. Okay. We probably need to make make a decision. Um, probably in the next week if we could, so we can get it into the notes and Heidi can provide the notes and we can add it to the notes from the meeting. Yeah, I'll, I'll find a time to get with you next week. Let's okay. talk about it a little bit. And we can Zoom or we can phone call or whatever you prefer. Are you off campus? Yeah, I am on campus on Tuesdays. Um, I come, I do a blended class. And so I'm there on Tuesdays, just usually from like 9.30 to about noon. Um, but that's the only time I'm, I'm there. The rest of the time I'm working from my home office. When is your class over? It runs from next week on Tuesday. It's a 10 to 11, 15. I think I'm going to be, I'm getting ready to give them a big assignment. So I think that class won't go the full time. So I'll probably be done by 1045. Well, I'll be finished at 1115. Okay. If you want to get together after, after I could Mark. I could do eleven fifteen and then I have class at one then so I've got to, I couldn't I just need to be back you know get ready for my one o'clock Zoom class. Are you in Baird? Yeah. I could run over there after my okay. class. Okay. Do you know where the comm office is? I'll find it. Okay, we're on the second floor. And okay. uh, so uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay. So I nominate Heidi 
I did the our secretary again. And Heidi is really good at taking notes, everybody. Her notes have always been really good and thorough, and I they're really appreciated. I'm happy to do it if no one else wants to. So um, at this time, I guess we can, um, we're not real formal in this group, but we can adjourn. We don't really have to have a motion or anything unless y'all just want to. Um, but um, do you want me to send out the notes from all last year to the group just to have everyone that's a good idea kind of refresh what we were talking about and how yeah. we might either I, bring things forward or chart a new course? I think that's a good idea because we can see what we might want to pull. Um, you do have all the committee members' names. Um, you have Kevin Waller and you have Blake uh, Wallander from the art department. And then of course, Brandon, and then your new person. And that, and, and Kevin Waller. And that should be our full, full committee. So um, Heidi, do you wanna do a poll for an October meeting like you've done before? Um, I will tell you all just off off the bat, we we found that Friday meetings ha are helpful. We've done them in this committee in the past, uh, but they also can come up with some um, some conflicts. Um, in October, we have fall break on the fifteenth and sixteenth, so that's going to be a conflict. Um, I know I have a I have a problem on the ninth. Um, my spouse is having a surgery that day and I'm going to have to be at beck and call for a wrist surgery. So we would be looking at probably the 23rd or the or 23rd or the 30th to get it about a month from now. If you, you know, does anybody want to weigh in on how their schedules look on the 23rd and 30th and that might help Heidi guide on timing? Well, we should try for the 23rd because November is going to have to be on the 20th, the latest. Right. Because that's our last day. Right. Yeah, I agree. It'll have to be the 13th or the 20th probably to get us about a month out. So I, the 23rd, how does 23rd look for the people that are here right now? Mine's open. I'm going to check Hi. mine here. Okay. My morning is good that day. I can't do afternoon. I've got a nine o'clock and that's it. Would you be done by 10 or 10 30? Yeah, yeah, I'd be done by, should be done by 10. Okay. I like 10 o'clock if that works on the 23rd, but Chris, how's it look for you? It looks fine right now. Tom, are you finding hey, anything? You know, it, it's good for me. Okay, Heidi, get it out quick. You know, you've got all it. of us. <laughs> I'm going to book it right now. And if and, the others can't go, then. And, and I am, and I'm recording this session, and I uh, I will send the recording out to those that missed the meeting, so they can at least see what they missed and know kind of where we're going. So, um, so tentatively the 23rd at 10 on Zoom, and then the other piece of it is between now and then we all need to be thinking about everyone could bring one or two ideas of some uh, strategies or, ta or tactics that we'd like to see this committee do between now and the end of uh, May or April 21 over the next two semesters would be really good that we could kind of talk through those ideas and maybe we can narrow them down to what we think we could do. Uh, and then, um, and Heidi will be sending out last year's minutes for everyone um, that can look at and see kind of what those are. And that might guide you a little bit on some ideas for that. And you said bring two ideas? I think a couple, yeah. You know, two or three, whatever whatever people can, can do. And um, I know that Tom and Kathy and, and Chris probably have some pretty interesting data analysis number quantitative ideas <laughs> i'm the qualitative guy okay okay good <laughs> give me a focus group that's, any why day. I'm, that's why i don't make a good secretary because i'm a numbers guy <laughs> i'm i'm focus groups all day long <laughs> all right okay 
Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you. Um, I guess we can go ahead and adjourn. And I, I appreciate everyone's service to our university. Um, I think we have some really good days ahead of us. And I, I just hope everyone will see that positivity and see that, that I love the quote that Heidi had said, we don't want to waste a good crisis. And I think that could be almost, Bruce, the, that could almost be the theme for this committee. <laughs> Bruce. Yeah. Bruce. Yes. That quote is attributed originally to Winston Churchill. Okay. You know, I, I thought, I thought it went back in history. It wasn't my original sure. for sure. Okay. So <laughs> Winston Churchill's quote, communicated by Heidi in our meeting today. <laughs> okay. Good crisis, go to waste. So, you know, whether you like Winston Churchill or you're not, boy, it's it, it still rings true today. For sure. All right. Well, thank you guys and gals and everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Yeah, have a good thank weekend. you. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye.